All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to a Rafael Medina infectious disease episode. I'm so excited for the session today. We have two wonderful clinicians from the University of British Columbia who um, are going to be taking part in this session. We have Dr. Sarah Belga, who will be the case discussant, and Dr. Allison Sumner, who will be presenting the case. Uh, and I'm Maddie, I'm gonna be facilitating the session. So I'm going to pass the mic to you, Allison, to um, introduce uh, Sarah, and then Sarah can introduce you. Thank you so much for presenting the case today. Awesome. Um, thanks so much, Maddie. Um, so my name is Allison. Um, I'm one of the senior fellows in infectious disease uh, at University of British Columbia, um, and I have Dr. Belga here. Um, so Dr. Belga um, completed her medical training in Portugal and then postgraduate training in Edmonton, Alberta, um, including a fellowship in um, transplant infectious disease. And then she has been uh, at Vancouver General Hospital since 2019 as one of the transplant infectious diseases staff. Um, and Dr. Belga and I got to spend part of my uh, fourth year together as she was my clinic supervisor, which was a great experience. Thank you, Ali. Um, and hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, so Allison already introduced herself a bit, but um, she came to BC uh, about a year and a half ago uh, for infectious disease training. She had previously uh, trained in Ontario, where she's from, and uh, her interests are uh, clinical education as well as uh, stewardship. And uh, she's a very kind, thoughtful, and enthusiastic fellow, and it's been a pleasure to work with her. Amazing. Thank you both so much. We're so lucky to, to have you here. Maybe before we jump into the case, maybe each of you, um, if you could share kind of what, why you love infectious disease and what um, prompted you to kind of consider training in it. Uh, Allison, maybe we, you can go first. Sure. Um, yeah, I did my uh, undergraduate training in kind of biology, like human biology and anthropology. And I just really loved where uh, so often in infectious disease, we're kind of caring for people at the intersection of kind of their health, um, their social circumstances, um, and, and a lot of kind of non-traditionally health considered things um, that that impact their, their well-being and transmission of infectious disease. So I found that to be an interesting part of the discipline. So for me, it was a bit different. I had a bit of a change of heart. I uh, initially uh, started residency in Portugal, where I'm from, and I was doing gastroenterology. And then when I came to Canada and I restarted internal medicine, I really fell in love with ID because of all the problem solving, I guess. It's one of the things I really love about medicine and just thinking about really complicated cases, you know, seeing people as a whole with their social histories being very important, travel history, where they have been. And really never having any boring moments in ID. I really love it. So hope to share some, some thoughts today. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, um, we can jump right into the case. So um, the scribe, you can go ahead and share your screen. And thank you for scribing. And Allison, whenever you're ready, you can jump into the first Alqua of the case. Oh, perfect. Great. Thanks. Um, so we'll start off um, with a little bit of an introduction. Um, so we had a 65-year-old male patient who presented to the hospital with two weeks of progressive right flank pain with associated subjective fevers, chills, and general malaise. Um, prior to this, for about a couple months, he had been having some intermittent voiding symptoms, including some urgency as well as incomplete voiding. Um, but no dysuria or suprapubic pain, and he was awaiting a urology assessment for this. Amazing. Thank you, Allison. We can pause here, and Sarah would love um, your initial thoughts on how you're thinking of this, this constellation of symptoms. Okay, great. So we have a um, man in his uh, 60s presenting with um, urinary tract symptoms, particularly flank pain, and as well as some hesitancy and avoiding difficulties, uh, which um, you know makes me think obviously about a um, more complicated urinary tract infection, including you know 
palynephritis and or prostatitis. So those are my thoughts. Again, not knowing anything about this patient and what medical history, if the patient is immunocompromised or not. Um, those are some of the thoughts. I think, um, you know, the constitutional symptoms, uh, perhaps, um, and, and I can't remember exactly how long the symptoms have been going on for, Alison. Is it one, two weeks? Two, two, two weeks. weeks. Okay. So it's sort of still relatively acute. Um, and and so in, in terms of trying to think if it's an acute process versus more subacute chronic, I think we could still think of um, an acute uh, infection at this point. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm supposed to keep going, but I, I know there's going to be a lot more information coming in that's going to obviously help. Uh, but before, obviously, I order any investigations, I'd like to know more about this patient, uh, particularly past medical history, previous urinary tract infections, et cetera. Yeah, no, thank you. That that was a phenomenal start to the discussion already. Um, one question, you know, for the, the learners who are, who are listening to this, I'm wondering if you could kind of clarify, how do you make a diagnosis of a urinary tract infection? And you mentioned um, kind of the term complicated, and I'm wondering if you could describe how you think of the differences between complicated and uncomplicated? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think it's uh, usually I think of uncomplicated and I don't usually see uncomplicated just as uh, a disclosure because as infectious diseases, we tend to see complicated. So that's why I, I jumped into that right away. But it's, uh, of course, being a man um, and, you know, having um, systemic symptoms as well as potential symptoms of prostatitis, um, that obviously, uh, you know, makes it complicated. For, the uncomplicated is really like the simple cystitis, which is something that, you know, is usually managed by non-infectious disease specialists. Um, but yeah, the fact that this is a male and has uh, systemic symptoms and symptoms of prostatitis, uh, to me, would be um, automatically complicated. And then one one also one other clarifying question: Does um does the presence of dysuria or kind of intermittent voiding to, is that necessary to kind of make the diagnosis, or how do you think about uh, kind of those symptoms in addition to the flank pain? Yeah, the, that that's a great question. I mean, uh, we usually um, a lower urinary tract infection like a cystitis. Um, starts with those symptoms. And so patients can have both symptoms of lower urinary tract infection as well as more upper uh, urinary tract infection, including systemic symptoms. Uh, but in this case, you know, we, we must not forget about the prostate as the prostate does cause a lot of lower urinary tract symptoms, but it, you know, it can have um, systemic symptoms. Um, and so I guess in terms of differentiating cystitis versus prostatitis, what really makes me concerned about prostatitis in this case is really the, you know, the chills, the general malaise, and uh, along with a lot of the lower urinary tract symptoms, which would not be consistent with just a simple cystitis. Amazing discussion. Thank you. Uh, all right, Allison, back to you. Awesome. Um, so I'll kind of round out some of the HPI um, in the review of systems. Um, so we had mentioned this patient had been having some subjective fevers, no objective measurement at home, um, and occasional night sweats, but hadn't lost any weight as an as appetite was still intact. Um, otherwise, hadn't had any headaches or neck pain, um, no cough, dyspnea, or sore throat, no rashes, no painful joints, um, no vomiting or diarrhea. Um, and then, as I mentioned, was having a few select voiding symptoms, so namely the urgency and incomplete voiding, but no dysuria. Um, and then um, the other thing that he had mentioned was that he had had a few episodes of left-sided vision loss over the past several days. Um, and so that was kind of his symptomatology. Um, I'll go into his past medical history. So he has a known history of coronary artery disease, and he has a known diagnosis of lichen sclerosis of the urethral meatus, so essentially some, some stenosis of the urethra. Uh, and then remotely, he's had an ACL repair. Uh, his medications, he is on a baby aspirin and a statin. Uh, he has no allergies. Uh, socially, uh, he was born in Ontario and has lived in BC since his early 20s. 
He's married with two children. Um, he lives in the suburbs. Um, they have a vegetable garden and a few chickens, but no other farm animal exposure. Um, and he works as a high school math teacher. Uh, he has a remote smoking history about 30 pack years, but quit uh, about um, 10 years ago um, and minimal alcohol use um, and no recent travel. Um, and I'll share his examination. Uh, if that's okay, Maddie, I think this is still eloquent too. Yeah, actually, you know, I was just thinking that this is such rich information. So I was thinking if it's all right with you, maybe we could. Sure, totally. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So uh, yeah, Sarah, we got a lot of interesting information, including vision loss, some of the past medical history. And I'm curious how this additional data is influencing how you're thinking about the patient and what could be going on. Yeah, great question. I mean, I was not expecting the left-sided vision loss as in, in, in this presentation, but again, the, that's uh, that's uh, sometimes it could be related, but it also could be unrelated. And actually the reason why the patient presented to the emergency, and that doesn't happen infrequently where patients come for one reason, and then we, f we find other things. But, you know, in terms of trying to put this together, of course, if if it's related to the, the, the current presentation, then, um, you know, it, it certainly makes me um, think of a more complicated uh, type infection. Um, you know, one of the immediate thoughts I have is certain pathogens that can cause uh, metastatic foci, it can cause infections in different areas. Um, you know, understanding this is someone was born in Ontario, not from Southeast Asia, but one pathogen that immediately came to mind was the hypervirulent Klebsiella pneumonia, which can sometimes cause abscesses in multiple different areas, including endophthalmitis. So that was a thought that I had, again, um, and, and, and it doesn't sound like the typical host for this. Um, and then also other thoughts, of course, if he was someone at risk for TB, which doesn't seem to be the case in this patient, I, I don't have any history um, of this patient having lived uh, in reserves or or, uh, up north or been um, incarcerated, et cetera, but sounds like someone who would be at low risk for TB. Um, you know, not necessarily that TB would uh, typically um, cause, you know, prostatitis or eye involvement, but in the context of a more disseminated infection, uh, that could happen. Uh, other thoughts that come to mind are, again, disseminated fungal infections, um, you know, typically the endemic fungi uh, in someone from Ontario, you know, so some thoughts that I have, I guess I don't really know where uh, where in Ontario the patient was, but like histoplasma, blastomyces um, would be two. And then cryptococcus, we see a lot of cryptococcus in, uh, in BC, certainly not typically with prostatitis and or eye involvement uh, necessarily. Uh, but again, if the patient had cryptococcus meningitis with high intracranial pressure, that could lead to some visual changes. Those are some of the thoughts. And then I would say Past medical history wise, I would say the lichen sclerosis of the erythral meatus is really the the the, the important um, piece here that would predispose to urinary tract infections. I would want to know also if the patient has had previous urinary tract infections this is the first time, because uh, that would be important in terms of management and knowing previous um, resistant patterns of bacteria, et cetera, and how to treat this. But of course, we haven't gotten to the investigation, I guess, even to the physical exam. So I'll probably will stop here and see if we can get a bit more information. Yeah, yeah, brilliant discussion. Um, Allison, I'll turn it back to you to for the physical exam. Sure. And I'll I'll just um speak to Sarah's question. So um no history of UTIs for this patient and hasn't recently been on antibiotics for for that or any other uh, infections. Um so in terms of exam, so uh, the patient, uh, I'll give you their vitals. Um, so they were febrile at 38.5 uh, and tachycardic with a heart rate of 130. Um, blood pressure was relatively normal at 120 over 70 um, with a respiratory rate of 12 and an SpO2 of 97% on room air. Um, generally, they, they actually weren't in any distress. They looked reasonably well. Um, uh, notably, so on head and neck exam, they didn't have any cervical lymphadenopathy, um, oral dentition looked normal, um, no carious um, appearing teeth. Uh, on cardiac exam, they were noted to have a systolic ejection murmur, heard best at the apex, about a two out of six. Um, on examination uh, of the extremities and of the conjunctiva, there were no peripheral stigmata of infective endocarditis. 
um, cardiac or the rest of the chest exam uh, showed normal bronchovesicular sounds, um, their abdomen, um, so anteriorly, um, no tenderness, no organomegaly, um, did have a bit of right flank tenderness on percussion. Um, and um, because this patient had mentioned some visual changes, a neurologic exam was done, which showed normal cranial nerves um, and grossly normal power, so five out of five in all four limbs with normal light touch sensation to four limbs. Um, they did go on to have a, a direct uh, fundoscopy exam, however, that showed some retinal hemorrhages and cotton wool spots. Right. Thank you, Allison. So, um, so quite a few uh, abnormalities in the physical exam. And Sarah, I'm curious how um, how this is influencing how you're thinking about the patient. For sure. Uh, there is one piece of information that I would like to request, but maybe I'll just share the thoughts first. Uh, so we have someone who's febrile and, you know, tachycardic, tachycardia likely resulting from the fever, but as well appearing. So um, doesn't appear to be septic, at least at this point. The systolic ejection murmur, um, you know, does it change? My, my thought, of course, you know, endocarditis is always in the differential even without peripheral stigmata, uh, but could also be just, you know, uh, aortic stenosis, especially at this age. And so it would be important to also see if the patient has had previous echocardiograms um, and, and go from there. Uh, in terms of the abdominal exam, which I think is where I'm going to focus uh, for the most part, is we do have some right flank tenderness, uh, which could be indicative of pyelonephritis. And um, I think I would maybe extend abdominal exam to try to get a, a DRE or digital rectal exam to see if there was any prostatic tenderness. Uh, so I'm not sure if that was done or not, but I would like to, to do that if it wasn't done. Um, yeah, so uh, a DRE was done, which was normal, non-tender, prostate, no blood. Okay, and then um, just looking at the retinal hemorrhage and the cotton wool spots. Okay, that's 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 important uh, information. I guess um, uh, at this point, um, you know, trying to think of infections um, that do affect the eye and uh, in a patient who's presenting with um, a, what, what now appears to be more in keeping with a perhaps pyelonephritis. Um, you know, could this patient um, be bactremic, et cetera, and could have that seated the eye, I think um, would certainly try to obtain further labs to uh, help me one way or the other, including uh, blood cultures would be uh, very, very important at, at this stage. Um, and, you know, some of those eye findings could certainly be old, um, and I, I would get ophthalmology to see the patient and comment a bit more on how these um, hemorrhages look like and in terms of, you know, distribution. But um, again, infective endocarditis, you know, certainly going through my mind, as we know that some patients can also have other metastatic flow state within the infective endocarditis. Um, so at this point is really what I'm kind of leaning more towards. Um, again, the digital rectal exam doesn't rule out prostatitis. Sometimes it can be a really difficult to tease that out, but you know, it's uh, it's something that also imaging is not great. Sometimes we have to get MRI and even so it's not perfect, but I'd perhaps start with just the basic labs and, um, and go from there. Thank you. And um, one question uh, that I have that also came up in the chat is at this point, you know, we, of course we don't have labs yet, but would you be starting antibiotics at this point? Um, kind of why or why not? Not without getting cultures. <laughs> Always get to cultures first. The patient, first of all, the patient doesn't appear to be crashing in front of us, right? Because he's generally well appearing. So the first step is really to try to, yeah, obtain blood cultures and you know, we, we and certainly urine cultures in this case. So that's the 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 priority. Um, we do, I mean, we do have a little bit of time because of what I mentioned, unless the patient changed and all of a sudden became septic and is crashing in front of us. Um, because I really want to make sure that I know what I'm treating. Uh, uh, again, it, depending, um, I would like to get a bit more information in terms of um, 
labs and get those cultures first um, and get the opinion of ophthalmology too on the fundoscopy exam. Um, but generally, if we're thinking more of a, a urinary tract infection, someone who's never had a, a previous uh, infection and has no history of M multidrug resistant organisms, you know, our go-to drug is usually ceftriaxone. Um, but I think in this patient, I'd like to wait a little bit more until I get more information. Definitely. Thank you. And one last question before we moved on, you mentioned um, the concern that both pyelonephritis and infective endocarditis. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you make um, how you make the diagnosis of pyelonephritis and how you make the diagnosis of infective endocarditis. Yeah, so I mean, both are generally clinical diagnosis. So starting off with pyelonephritis. Uh, so pyelonephritis is typically a clinical diagnosis based on, um, you know, Systemic symptoms can be, uh, you know, fever, malaise, um, having even sweats, uh, and then um, having flank pain uh, is really the typical sign on a physical exam. And then, of course, having a urinalysis that shows pyuria and some a little bit of uh, hematuria as well. Um, and other symptoms that are typically associated with pyelonephritis are like nausea, vomiting. So take that into account. Um, but you don't wait, obviously, for their urine culture exams just, just or results to start treating for pyelonephritis. So typically, just a clinical uh, with you know having fever and right flank pain is enough to start treating empirically in that case. Um, and then um, I would say that for the endocarditis, again, it's also usually <laughs> starts off with a clinical diagnosis of, uh, you know, typically someone with uh, on physical exam has a murmur, is presenting with fevers and concerns for um, stigmata, like stigmata in the skin, but also, you know, the retinal hemorrhages that are somewhat unexplained. Um, I don't think this is a patient who's a diabetic, no, just having coronary artery disease. Um, and so, you know, someone who usually looks quite ill and has um, fevers and murmur, uh, and then again, we do get the blood cultures, get the, the echocardiogram um, and look for other metastatic, metastatic foci because patients with endocarditis can have infections in many, many different places. Um, but usually the, the, those are kind of the thoughts um, without having any additional lab data. Thank you. All right, Allison, back to you. So we'll start off with some of the basic blood work. Um, so white count was done 5.9. Hemoglobin was a bit low at 103. Platelets were also a bit low at 124. Uh, sodium was 130. Potassium, 3.8. Creatinine was 106 from a baseline in the 90s. Uh, CRP was quite elevated at 178. Um, extended electrolytes were normal. Liver enzymes were normal. Um, blood cultures and urine cultures were collected. Um, and Maddie, you can let me know if you'd like me to uh, talk about the prelim gram stain on those. Yeah, sure. You can give the prelim gram stain and then we can um, hear Sarah's interpretation of that. Sure. And do you want me to share the initial imaging as well? Uh, yeah, great question. Maybe we can, um, after the preliminary uh, gram stain, maybe we can pause there and then hear Sarah's thoughts sure. before. The Sounds good. Okay. Um, yeah, so so gram stain was done uh, quite quickly and uh, showed gram positive cocci and clusters. Awesome. So maybe before we get any imaging, you know, Sarah, how, like, how, how do you interpret uh, uh, GPCs in clusters, and would that would you um, kind of start antibiotics at this time? Most certainly, yeah. So basically, we have you know we have positive, um, I guess, urine blood cultures, and we have gram positive in uh, clusters, which to me is staph, staph, staph. So again, we don't know what type of staph species it could be, uh, staph aureus or uh, quaglase negative staph, but in someone who um, is not known to have any at least prosthetic or indwelling devices as far as I can tell. This is going to be stuff or is until uh, proven otherwise. And at this point, um, or I mean, there's other uh, quick negative stuff that can behave like staph aureus, for example, staph lugdunensis. Uh, and there are other um, staph species that can also um, 
present similarly, but regardless, at this point, uh, my uh, I want to start antibiotics right away. Um, and so I would start both sulfazolin and vancomycin. And, you know, this approach may vary depending on, you know, different ID physicians. The main rationale is that if it's MSSA or methicillin susceptible staph aureus, I, I, I prefer um, uh, anti-staphylococcal um, beta-lactam and sulfazolin is my go-to is usually um, well tolerated um, and then cloxacillin and also like unless I'm worried about a specific uh, infection in the CNS etc that's my usual uh, empiric choice and then the vancomycin is of course in uh, in case this is a methicillin resistant uh, staph uh, aureus or other uh, staph that tend to be resistant to methicillin um, or oxacillin or nafcillin, which you know depends on where you're um, practicing. Um, then I go with vancomycin, and of course, when I have the susceptibilities, then I drop one of the two. So that's what I would what, what I would do. Great, thank you. And um, I, I'm hearing you saying that the the GPCs and clusters, you know, it's kind of staph aureus until proven otherwise. I'm curious, kind of what else could fall um, fall under that gram stain besides besides staph. Yeah, I mean, um, the the reason why you know the cluster, the cl there are other species, of course, and you know there are uh, like Aerococcus, Micrococcus, certain types of species that are still gram positive in clusters. But I would say like they're much rarer. There's so many different staph species, and for the most part, it's it's you know I would say probably ninety five percent of the cases it's going to be staph. Of course, if it was staph in, um, sorry, gamma positive cocci in chains, that, you know, that would be a bit different. And we would think of things like streptococci or antrococci. Um, but in, in this case, I mean, I would say for the most part, it's, uh, I would think of staph species, though there's, of course, others that I have mentioned uh, that could also cause this, though less commonly. Great. And then, um, you know, moving forward, what tests would you, um, what tests would you be ordering from here? Uh, in tests in terms of like imaging and all of that or? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I think those three that are already listed there, certainly I would want, I'm worried about endocarditis. I want to see if there's any heart blocks. So I, I certainly want an ECG. I want a chest x-ray because obviously um, it's it's usually a good initial test regardless. And even for endocarditis, there could be some changes, some septic emboli, some infiltrates. Uh, so those two tests I would uh you know, certainly order and I can get results really quickly. Whereas the echocardiogram, it usually takes a little time to get an echocardiogram. I usually start with a transthoracic um, and, uh, and and then go from there. And sometimes we do need to go to TE uh, or transesophageal, uh, depending on the findings. But those would be the first. And then I think at this point, I'm also a bit concerned of what is going on in that kidney. And at minimum, I would obtain uh, ultrasound of the kidney um, you know, things like, you know, could there be abscesses in the kidney? Um, the, 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 both tests, I mean, ultrasound is probably easier and faster to get, uh, and, you know, obviates the need for contrast. So it could be a good initial test to get, but, uh, occasionally we may have to get a CT to look at other organs and, um, for example, looking at the liver, the spleen, um, you know, could there be something else going on there? And of course, I mean, to taking a a look at the prostate and and bladder. Even though none of these tests are perfect for for prostate or bladder, but those would be sort of my initial tests. All right, Allison, we'll turn it back over to you. And if you have the information, I'd be curious if um if the team started uh, antibiotics at this point. Um. Yeah. So. Um... Yes, uh, definitely. Um, I think um, prior to um, the cultures being resulted, um, they were started on antibiotics given that they were generally unwell and febrile, but certainly it was after the blood cultures and urine cultures had been collected. Um, so initially, yeah, I think they were started on ceftriaxone given the kind of flank pain and, and thoughts about a urinary process. Um, uh, so that was started and then kind of modified after um, the initial gram stain results had uh, been released from the um, blood culture. So vancomycin was added um, in addition to the ceftriaxone. 
Um, and I'll give you a bit more in terms of the preliminary imaging. So a chest X-ray was done, which, which was generally normal, um, didn't show any parenchymal disease, didn't show any cardiac enlargement. Um, an ECG was performed, which showed normal sinus rhythm um, with no evidence of heart block. Um, a CT scan of the abdomen was done given the flank pain, and there was a two centimeter right renal abscess with associated fat stranding. Um, and then again, because of the visual changes, a CT head was done, which showed a possible small left cerebellar infarct. Well, thanks, Alison. I almost had forgotten about the, the, the CNS symptoms by, by this point, but certainly, yeah, I would agree with pursuing a minimum of CT head, uh, which is which is interesting, but certainly is you know, makes a very strong case for endocarditis. You know, this is endocarditis still proven otherwise. And just to kind of go back to why, you know, it's a bit, again, a clinical diagnosis, but we have a lot of different constellation of symptoms that is usually not explained by anything else other than this. Uh, and so with the retinal hemorrhage, possible cerebellar infarct, I'm trying, starting to think, of course, of um, septic emboli more than, um, you know, something like a mycotic aneurysm, which typically would result in hemorrhage. Um, and, and so, you know, septic emboli to the eye, to the brain, um, and, uh, and certainly to the kidney, which has resulted in, in the abscess. I mean, the other thing we didn't really didn't discuss, um, is of course, because of the, the flank pain and, and the urinary symptoms, again, would it be worth imaging the spine? Because a lot of the times these patients can also have, um, vertebral osteomyelitis and, um, and, 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 you know, presenting with flank, but at this point we do have the renal abscess, so it makes it less likely. I guess I would be very careful with just examining the patient, making sure that they're not developing any spinal tenderness and neurologic symptoms that would also warrant a, a, a MRI of the spine. Yeah, and, and one question I had is, um, I'm curious, how is your mind connecting kind of the urinary symptoms that this patient has, including the renal abscess, with your concern for infected endocarditis? Yeah, certainly, great question. Um, so, you know, how, how would you connect the kidney and the brain? I mean, that's usually how I think about this is, uh, it's, it has to be a, a more systemic uh, sort of endovascular infection, The you know, how this started and why this patient has this. I mean, the, the biggest question, you know, in someone who has a stent or some sort of indwelling, um, catheter or, uh, you know, other nephrostomy tubes, et cetera, we, we, we see these pathogens. It's not very common to see this in someone without it. But again, it's thinking of staph warriors, um, if, if that's staph warriors, which I'm not sure it will be, uh, it basically, you know, it can, it, it can start in one place and then cause, you know, back to how this started, we will never know. But the fact that there is a cerebellar um, infarct makes me really wondering about that because how else would you uh would you connect the two um and so you know my, my thought is that this patient may have had some bacteremia initially with this and then it just seeded the the kidney and that's how it uh, developed the abscess and then it just threw a septic it may have just threw septic and blind to different areas including the brain and the kidney Amazing. And before we get kind of results from the culture, I'm curious, what um, what are the kind of the most common bugs, um, I guess, to your knowledge that can cause um, an infective endocarditis picture, if that's what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So there's there's many. Um, I mean, staff, uh, staff warriors is the, by far, at least in where I practice, the the most common uh, one. Um, and so starting off with the gram positive organisms. So we have, we've talked about um, Staphylococcus aureus. There's also the coagulase negative staph, which you know can happen um, in native valves, but we tend to see those more often when there's prosthetic valves. Um, and then, you know, it's it's interesting because the for staph aureus, this, you know, this took a little longer than I would think, but I have seen staph aureus, you know, take a more like a less acute presentation at times. Um, but you know. With with the presentation uh, initially, without knowing what the pathogens would be, you know certainly um, organisms like Streptococcus, and particularly the virulence group Strep, uh, being common um, pathogens that can result uh, in more subacute presentations where patients sometimes go 
on to have two months of like weight loss, uh, sweats, feeling it well until they present, unfortunately, with strokes because they uh, had a big um, embolic stroke or had a um, mycotic aneurysm that ruptured, things like that. Um, and so within the strep, there's a lot of other uh, kind of related, um, uh, including, for example, uh, some of the um, uh, gamella species, uh, some of the so-called nutritionally variant um, strep. Um, and uh, and then we think of like hassock organisms as well that, you know, used to be more fastidious and we in the past, people would worry that they wouldn't grow in cultures, but in nowadays they tend to grow in cultures. And then um, also would think of um, uh, the Enterococcus, Enterococcus faecalis being uh, actually more common than Enterococcus faecium as a cause of uh, endocarditis. And in fact, there's some discussions currently about this as being uh, in someone with unexplained Enterococcus faecalis bacteremia, you know, endocarditis is more, more common than we had initially thought. Um, and um, and then uh, thinking, well, the HASAC, I sort of jumped a little bit, I apologize, uh, because HASAC tend to be more like already uh, gram negatives, whereas the strep, enterococcus, um, and staph are uh, the gram positive. Um, and then, I mean, within those, there's other like gram positives, like micrococcus or coccus that I mentioned that I don't think they're very common causes of endocarditis, but can certainly uh, rarely do that as well. And then some of the um, gram negative bacteria that fortunately are not very common because they tend to be more severe and these patients tend to uh, usually require um, surgery. Um, you know, some of the uh, E. coli, Klebs, Pseudomonas, they tend to be less common, fortunately for us. Um, and then, um, I mean, I'm just very broadly speaking, there's multiple others that I could get into, but um, then thinking of fungal and fungal with Canada being the top uh, but some of the other endemic fungi, for example, histoplasma, coccidioides can cause um, endocarditis as well. And very, more rarely the aspergillus and uh, those types of molds, um, but they tend to have very severe infection and again, also require surgery, not infrequently. Incredible, thank you. Um, all right, Allison, what happened next in the case? Yeah, so, um... Uh, patient did get a transesophageal echocardiogram, um, which showed a two centimeter mitral valve vegetation with severe regurgitation and valvular perforation. Um, also on the basis of the findings in the CT head, they went on to have an MRI, which showed multiple bilateral acute and subacute cerebral infarcts. Um, and then finally, um, actually after um, much debating in the lab, and you'll see why, um, the both blood and urine culture ended up growing aerococcus urinae as the final pathogen. So oh, interesting, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just going to say, I would love your kind of reactions to this. Yeah, no, it's definitely not a common pathogen, but it's, you know, as the name implies, aerococcus urinae can certainly cause urinary tract infections. And it's a, it's a gram positive cocci that in a way a lot is, is similar to, to staph, to staph. Um, and, uh, and so it is known to cause um, endocarditis. And this is interesting because it's sort of like, you know, maybe that start as a urinary tract infection that then uh, kind of disseminated beyond the kidney and led to um, the infective endocarditis. Um, and so it's, you know, it doesn't matter which one came first, I guess, at the end of the day, we do know what we have in front of us right now. And so I think it's certainly um, a relatively uncommon cause of um, endocarditis, but certainly possible. And, um, you know, it's, it, it might make sense in this case in someone presenting with a right uh, renal abscess. Yeah, and we'll, we'll learn more from, from Allison about how um, the patient was treated, but I'm, I'm curious, Sarah, how would you approach thinking about treatment and antibiotic selection and kind of duration for, for this patient? Yeah, uh, great question. So I, I, the, first, uh, the first thing to think is always, you know, First is the pathogen, and then you, you think, is this a native versus prosthetic valve endocarditis, right? So in this case, we have 
a native valve endocarditis, and we have a pathogen that's a relatively uncommon. So, you know, in terms of experience and, you know, the guidelines and recommendations, it's all going to be based on very minimal information. But a lot of the times we kind of extrapolate from other more similar organisms. Um, and so in this case, I, I would probably treat this as a, uh, a native valve endocarditis secondary to staph warriors, for example. So would would uh, err on the side of treating for a little longer, uh, which is like usually the treatment for endocarditis is somewhere between four to six weeks. Um, and so in this case, I probably would err on the side of treating for um, six weeks. And in terms of susceptibility results, I actually haven't seen any aer aerococcus recently to know what the typical susceptibility are, but I would think, you know, vancomycin probably, I um, if it um, ends up being methicillin uh, resistant, uh, which probably is given that it's aerococcus. But I would ask, <laughs> Allison, what was the susceptibility result if we can have that? Yeah, so, um, so you know, you're exactly right, um, kind of wanting to know that information. So this isolate was actually susceptible to um, penicillin G as well as f -triaxin. Oh, interesting. So, um, okay. Uh, so it's actually susceptible to penicillin um yeah because i guess it's it, it is um a little different because it's uh, uh i'm just seeing what the gram stain is saying there so i'm just reading it uh penicillin septrax and so i guess in this case um you know in this case actually perhaps i would change my thinking i was more thinking because of the clusters and thinking more staph whereas but perhaps it seems like actually a bit more similar to the strep versus group strep. It does, I mean, it doesn't, it probably doesn't matter too much in this case, um, because I think at minimum, you obviously going to treat for four weeks and you'd want to repeat imaging of the kidney, at least at the end of therapy to ensure that that abscess has um, at least significantly reduced in size. But I, you know, in this case, we could actually just treat with penicillin. However, sometimes penicillin as an outpatient, it's a lot of volume, you know, it's uh, some, um, kidney issues, sodium, et cetera, may not be necessarily the easiest. So not infrequently, we do go with ceftriaxin, which is once a day. Um, but from a switch of perspective, penicillin would definitely be the narrow spectrum um, antibiotic. Um, if we could do that, um, perhaps would be the best. Um, if it's feasible, depending on where the patient lives, uh, you know, lots of other barriers that sometimes we encounter for uh, home IV antibiotics. Um, and yeah, I, I would say like probably four to six weeks of antibiotics in this case, I guess I would, um, see how the patient is doing around the four week mark and uh, have a renal ultrasound just to assess, um, everything and ensure that the patient is clinically, um, is clinically better. And obviously also depends on toxicity from antibiotics. Is this patient having a lot of issues with antibiotics? You know, because long-term antibiotics can result in lots of issues. So in the endocarditis, uh, you know, because we treat for long, you know, we monitor them weekly with uh, CBC and differential um, creatinine electrolytes. Um, and so some some of some patients may develop um, you know, acute kidney injury, um, you know, with beta lactams, acute interstitial nephritis being one. Potential complication with ceftriaxone. and sometimes we see um, liver injury with the cholestatic picture. Um, and so it, again, depends on the toxicity, toxicity profile um, and how the patient is tolerating. Uh, but um, I don't know how long this patient was treated, but I would say minimum four weeks. And we'll see how the patient is doing at that point in the site. Yeah, they got six weeks of treatment. Kind of erring more on the side of a longer course because it is such an uncommon pathogen. Um, and they ended up being treated with uh, ceftriaxone and actually were given uh, two grams Q12 hours because of the multiple kind of cerebral, which were presumed to be kind of cephic emboli. But fortunately, like, you know, apart from his fundoscopy, um, the rest of his neuro exam was completely normal, um, didn't have any deficits, um, and didn't have any further issues with his vision. Okay, and the patient recovered completely from that standpoint? Yeah, so so they went on. Um, I'll, I'll say the only other complicating piece about the story that I left out um, was that they they developed a DVT like during this acute illness. Um, and so they ended up um they ended up going for 
of valve replacement um, because of the degree of valvular dysfunction from the endocarditis. So they had a valve replacement um, and then um, they were actually waiting for um, a um, urology procedure to manage the stricture of the urethra, which was actually felt to be the, the we, you know, we were quite concerned and like wanted that to be definitively managed because we presumed that's how this patient got this um, severe infection. Um, but it had to be delayed because they were on therapeutic anticoagulation for about three months after this episode. So they did subsequently go and have this procedure done and, and they're doing well, not having any urinary symptoms any longer, had a successful dilatation procedure. So overall, they're actually doing quite well. Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, you just brought up a very important point because it's not only the medical management, but the surgical management in endocarditis. Um, you know, I was focused on the diagnosis and how we approach, et cetera, and, you know, treating from an antibiotic standpoint. But, you know, the, the, the very important part here that would want us to consult um, cardiovascular surgery right away is this, you know, severe regurgitation valvular perforation, which are indications for surgery, for example, aortic root abscess or someone who's bacteremic beyond uh, five to seven days. Um, th those are just some examples. Uh, there are major and uh, minor indications for surgery, but it's, it is definitely a very important part of, of the management um, of, of endocarditis. And, and so it sounds like this patient that did have the the valve replacement, which sometimes, you know, it, if there's a significant delay uh, of, of the valve replacement, it, it could uh, impact the antibiotic uh, duration um, because sometimes, you know, it, it's not until three or four weeks from the initial diagnosis that they end up going to the OR because they were not uh, stable enough to go to you know OR initially. And so um, in, 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 in our center, at least we, we tend to, uh, wait for the cultural results and see, uh, if the, the, the valve tissue is still growing, you know, we kind of reset the clock and, and start over. Whereas if not, we just go, uh, with, with the, the initial, um, duration of six weeks, which is already a lot. So, um, I, I would say that's, uh, an important piece, um, it's, um, to consult cardiology and uh, cardiovascular surgery right away in these cases. Amazing. And, and um, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Allison. Sorry. I just, uh, for context, I'm just looking at the date. So they, they did end up going for surgery about a week after they were diagnosed with endocarditis. Um, and just like Sarah had said, fortunately, they sent the tissue for uh, culture and nothing ended up growing. So we actually started the clock six weeks from the time of blood culture clearance. And I, Allison, I was just going to ask, um, before we pass the mic to Sarah to highlight, you know, key teaching points um, for, for those listening, I just wanted to ask if you wanted to share anything you learned um, from taking care of this patient or about this um, specific type of aerococcus causing endocarditis. Yeah, I think, I think overall it was just um, like seeing how it rolled out. It was just very humbling and to, to keep in mind kind of exactly like Sarah had said, you know, when you get bits of information, you kind of want to plan for the worst case scenario. So seeing gram positive cocci in clusters and thinking about staph aureus, like we need to make sure that we're covering for things like that. Um, but also, you know, keeping in mind the other processes for this person having a, a kind of a urinary tract that process. And I think what was also challenging and what's interesting about aerococcus, well, I mentioned the lab part, you know, we see one morphology pattern on gram stain, but on the agar plate, they're actually very small colonies. They have alpha hemolysis. And so they look just like a viridans group strep. And so this patient was treated kind of with the vancomycin and ceftriaxone, given that information and given before we kind of knew what the pathogen was, because there was this uncertainty. Um, so I think overall, it's just humbling to, to remember that there's always new things. And, and like Sarah had said, you know, ideas always fun and interesting and challenging. Um, and certainly this was one of those cases. And, and I think, you know, coming back to, um, we always have this mantra and ID being like source control, but, but like with anything in medicine, you want to, you want to treat the origin of the problem. So, you know, I was very fixated on this patient getting his, um, urethral procedure. And I remember initially he was, you know, um, you know, when it had to be delayed for anticoagulation um, factors, we were all quite anxious about him getting more definitive treatment because I was quite convinced this is how it had started. 
Um, yeah, but just really, really interesting. When I had reviewed this, there were, have been about 50 cases of infective endocarditis with Aerococcus urinae, so definitely not common. Um, so, so it was a really interesting case for me. Yeah, well, thank you, Alison, for a great case. I have to say, it's it, it, this is my first Aerococcus infective endocarditis, but I guess we, you know, we always have our first, and sometimes it takes many years uh, of practice to see certain things in ID. It's just like that. So. Um, you know, that's why ID is so humbling because, you know, you there's so much to learn and uh, we're always learning. Um, uh, yeah, I would say that um, that uh, in, in, in an endocarditis, I guess, um, you know, when you have someone presenting with syndromes in areas that are like so far apart from each other and doesn't quite make sense, how does this patient have something in the kidney and something in the brain, you know, think endocarditis. Uh, for example, when I was a trainee, I still remember a patient presenting um, with cerebral uh, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, spontaneous hemorrhage from uh, aneurysm rupture, and the patient had staph aureus in the blood, and he wasn't thought of as related. But, you know, it is because, you know, we know that staph aureus can cause mycotic aneurysm, can cause endocarditis. And, and so um, it's, it's, a, it's a, and there's no, no single patient that has the exact same presentation. So it, all patients can be completely different. But I would say that that's a, a, a learning point. Um, and uh, I, I, I think, yes, the second uh, is that empirically for endocarditis, we didn't quite touch upon that. I guess the, initially things were a bit undifferentiated, but if I was really worried about endocarditis, you know, after getting cultures and make sure you get blood cultures, there's never too many blood cultures to order up front because the worst thing that you can do to an ID doc is start antibiotics and then order cultures. It really hurts. It's really painful for us so i would say because then we don't know and we may have to commit this patient to like you know ceftriaxone and vancomycin for six weeks and um and it's with with more toxicities and and problems right um and so i would say that the empirically ceftriaxone and vancomycin um um is usually a, a reasonable choice for native valve endocarditis up front and it does really target most organisms the ones i mentioned like pseudomonas etc that's exceedingly rare um and so um you know not usually worried about pseudomonas up front unless it's someone who's already had pseudomonas and it's presenting with like a, a recurrent symptoms um i'd say those are the the, the empiric uh, choices that we would um, cover and yeah, the, the thing is always like thinking how this happened. So in ID, we always like know why did this happen? Why did this happen now? And what Allison said is very important because this patient had this urethral stricture, you know, with a pathogen being urococcus urinae. I mean, it had to come from there. So it probably started off as uh, a um, a sending infection to the kidney with bacteremia. Bacteremia led to a more systemic infection and endocarditis. And so addressing the underlying problem is is key because if you don't, then this patient may come back with another infection and now has a prosthetic valve. So imagine having a secondary bacterial infection, a prosthetic valve infection on top of, of that new valve. And so it's it's just really try to not just treating what's in front of you, but preventing that from happen, uh, happening again is very, very important. Thank you both so much. Allison, that was a phenomenal case presentation and Sarah really expertly discussed. So really appreciate both of your time and your teaching. Um, yeah, just really uh, thank you so much. And we will uh, end the session here. Um, and thank you to the scribe and to Tansu for jotting down the, um, the numerous teaching points. Uh, and we will end the session. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us, Maddie. Have a good night.